Okay, so um, our next next on the docket for our whirlwind tour of yes. Um, great question. Um, like a, when you're in the, on your web page, like a control, yeah. like a control yep. plus or something. Yeah, to, to make the, the font size bigger? Yeah. Sure, that's a great suggestion. I'll, I'll see if I can do that. Thank you very much, Leon. Okay, so um, in this uh, next uh, session, what I'm going to be doing is, is uh, taking a look at communicational data sources that uh, provide another source of rich information for informing our system science models, grounding those models, providing evidence for calibration, but also evidence for filtering of those models. Um, we're going to be looking at at uh, two data sources that also match these four V's we've been talking about, the volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. We've talked about mobile data collection, data collection that can embrace wearables and on-device sensors um, that can involve ecological momentary assessments triggered by context or triggered by time of day, and proactive reporting by users, say, with buttons. We're now going to be talking about elements on this area of the spectrum, which, while um, uh, fun, uh, well, well, uh, less uh, detailed in character, uh, painting a less detailed picture of individual behavior, they provide a potent source of, of data over time for understanding um, uh, attitudes, uh, interests, uh, concerns in the population. <clears throat> and I want to emphasize here that as with Ethica, what we're interested in here is a lens that will help us understand behavior over time. Um, that may have been submerged in the, the Ethica confusion of, um, of uh, pictures submitted and, and people's responses, etc. But um, uh, in the context of Ethica, um, that behavior, that, that data that's coming in on step counts and on um, GPS locations, um, data in other studies which might involve proximity to, uh, to objects, uh, accelerometry or what have you, um, it's, it's very uh, rich and high temporal density data. So in other words, it, it comes in very quickly and um, with comparatively large amounts of information compared to what? What's, current, what's traditionally available. So it is in this area as well. So uh, we're interested in our behavior over time. We're interested in tapping these data sources, uh, things like search behavior online and, and, and data on uh, publishing platforms and social media, to look at dynamics, to look at growth and waning of interest in response to events, trends over time um, in uh, discussion of particular topics. Um, the first top, the first um, data source I want to talk about here is uh, I've referred to it several times before: search behavior. Uh, and here we're looking at the number of queries people are submitting to search engines at a relative level within a given region geographically over time sometimes as small as a couple hours or even an hour, sometimes as long as a day or two or three at a time, etc. These are aggregate results. They don't relate to a particular individual. If we see a hundred submissions of a query, we don't know whether it's one person submitting many, many times or whether it's a hundred different people submitting. It's comparatively coarse resolution in terms of what it provides us. We see the search expression, but not what lies behind it in terms of, of uh, fuller understanding of, of their interests. Um, and uh, we're, we're seeking here 
to leverage the uh, trend information for particular engines. Um, we're going to be taking a look specifically at Google Trends as a source here because of its rich data, bearing in mind it's not the only search engine out there. So I'd like to walk you through this. Um, specifically, I would invite you to, to go and take a look here at uh, Google Trends. So I'm going to call up trends.google.com. Okay? T R E N D S dot Google dot com. Now, this provides uh, an interface which uh, faces the public um, and not merely researchers. Um, individuals <clears throat> are interested in all sorts of different topics, and you can see some of the many types of uh, searches that have been uh, conducted recently. I'd like to suggest searching um, for uh, topics uh, that might be interesting from a health perspective. Um, uh, something might be, for example, influenza um, here. And if we, we search for influenza, what it's going to give us is not search results for influenza, um, but rather indications of how many people are searching for the term influenza over time, okay? Um, now, you'll notice that it's showing this for me by default from the states, by default over the past 12 months. I'm going to broaden my look here. I'm going to uh, take a look, say, over 2004 to the present, and you'll notice a certain regularity that's events. Regularity with, with some variation. Does anyone want to remark? What are the nature of these fluctuations, this waxing and waning? When do you think these peaks might be? Yeah, so, so you'll notice this peak is January 2013, this peak is January 2014, January 2015. This one is interestingly is a bit later. This one is February 2015. Influenza is a seasonal communicable disease uh, for most people, not for those in, in nursing homes. Um, if we were to look, for example, not at the US, but if we were to look for uh, something like Australia, um, I would venture that we'd see a rather different Patterning. When do you think the peaks would be here? May, August, September, August. Flu season is, lies in, in uh, different timings in Australia. I want to highlight a few additional features with this, going back to the US. Yeah. You can see something about the, 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 um, uh, the, the sourcing of these tweets, um, whence they come. Uh, and there's an interesting preponderance here of, um, of tweets in the upper Midwest, for example. Um, we, could we could narrow that down uh, by year, um, and we'll come back to that point in a moment. You'll notice there's a set of related topics given. Um, and these are I want to emphasize not terms, not queries, indeed those lie on the right, but topics. And, and uh, within this engine of Google Trends, there's a distinction made between a topic, which can involve a set of related search terms on the one hand, versus a specific query. What's sh uh, shown on the left is, is uh, related topics. Um, so broader categories. What's shown on the right is related queries. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, there's a, um, uh, there's a set of queries which are, uh, w which are uh, related to it, for example, involving H1N1, which don't involve a specific, uh, a specific uh, uh, specifically mentioning influenza 
but being germane to it. You'll notice when the overwhelming interest in those was, it was doing the, during the flu pandemic of 2009, 2010, which is indeed when the IEP project that eventually gave rise to Ethica's technology was originated. That was this period here, okay? So here we have a, um, a depiction of patterns over time where these patterns over time are rich, I would even say complex, very similar to the sorts of patterns that Xiao Yan, for example, um, will be talking about uh, in her presentation on um, with particle filtering and childhood infectious diseases, for example. This waxing and waning is indicative of changes in susceptible and infectious populations. I'd like now, however, to drill down a little bit more. We can drill down in a couple of ways. One thing is that we could click on a particular region and see queries specific to that region. You can even look within certain metro areas. For example, this is Sioux Falls versus Rapid City with a particular interest uh, within the Sioux Falls area. Um, we can also look at particular periods of time. You'll notice that this data here is, is specified at the level of months. Let's go look within the past year, okay? So I'm going to say the past 12 months here, okay? You'll notice now this data is specified instead of on a month-by-month -month basis. What's the, what's the granularity fit now, time-wise? Anyone? It's week at a time. Let's try the last seven days, shall we? What's the granularity of this now? Hourly. Hourly, ladies and gentlemen. So the granularity with which the data is, is summarized is a reflection of the querying that you're undertaking with respect to uh, this sort of data source. You can narrow down, yes, by, by geographic reason, region, but you can also narrow down in time and get more fine-grained data. Now this raises a possibility when it's combined with another feature that I'm about to show you. So first of all, I would note that any of these can be downloaded as a CSV file. So by pressing this button, we can we can call this down as a CSV. I can go and I can open it here, and I can see over time the responses, uh, the, the number, of, the relative number of, of searches <coughs> at different times of day on different days, uh, and I can do so within a certain period of time. There's nothing to prevent me from further saying past seven, instead of past seven days, I could say a custom time range, right? Um, maybe I could do it from um, uh, over a, um, a, a seven day period, for example, um, from um, uh, the, so this is uh, uh, the 10th of, of uh, uh, or the 12th of, of uh, October, I believe they're phrasing it as there, to the, um, I'm, I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm parsing this right, um, to the uh, 18th of October, 2017. I have a feeling I've got this uh, notation backwards, yes. Yeah. So, so we need to reverse it. It's you click the down arrow and get a calendar. Cool, thank you. I love these crowdsourced, uh, this is, this is great. So the down arrow here will put a calendar. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, why is this not um, cooperating here? Um, uh, okay, um, so uh, okay, October 10th, 2017 to let's say uh, uh, October 
uh, October 16th, 2017, okay? Um, and I'll say, go here. And uh, here, I, I'm looking at data at the level of a, of a day at a time. So one thing you can do is you can knit together data sources downloaded from different periods of time to accomplish um, aggregating by a common level of, of aggregation. And generally speaking, if you do it for shorter periods of time, you'll get a finer grain level of aggregation. In other words, here we're doing it a day at a time. We couldn't get an hour at a time at this point historically, but we could at least get a day at a time. And by getting overlapping windows going backwards, we can knit them together to a sequence of very long length that's disaggregated in a, in a day by day basis historically. Okay? This is important because otherwise you might be tempted to think that you can only get things, for example, over a longer historic period on a month by month basis. No, you can go in, you can look at small periods here, get those on a day by day basis, and knit together an entire sequence by putting overlapping periods. The trick here is another point that I want to emphasize. This data is normalized. By normalized, I mean within each window, it's set to go from 0 to 100. Okay? It's set to go to a maximum of 100. What this means is that you have to be careful on how you knit these elements together from overlapping windows. It's kind of like you're finding the the translation between them. By having overlapping elements, you could see, okay, how does the relative scale in this in the month of October relate to the relative scale in the month of November by having a window that includes both. We have an algorithm that Refot, um, in fact, put into place to, to knit together elements over time. And one of my hopes this week is to share that algorithm with you so you can go back and get day-by-day -day data over long periods of time without worrying that they're on incompatible scales. Because otherwise, it's going to scale it for that window to be, um, to be from 0 to 100. You'll notice, uh, or up to 100, you'll notice the peak here is in 100. And if we were to go look only at the past 12 months, once again, its peak will be at 100. Okay. So this is at a different scale. This um, January 28th through February 3rd, for example, if we look back over this entire time, um, is, is not at 100. So in short, it rescales the data for the window looked at, but there's ways of cleverly getting data on sub-windows to knit them together into a coherent day-by-day -day summary over very long periods of time. So you can have day-by-day -day reporting over years and years. Um, that's something we've done. We've done it for Australia, and we've done it some for, um, for the US, I believe. OK. Is there any way to get the, uh, the actual number of searches to be able to say compare with regions? Say, like, so within a region, that's fine. But if you? The actual number of searches is, seems to be jealously guarded. Um, the, there was a mechanism um, that Anahita tapped into, and um, uh, she might want to comment more on this, either now or in her presentation later. Um, Google did make available some of this information for more specialized purposes, uh, specifically with respect to influenza. So they had something called Google Flu Trends, which, Anahita, you've got to correct me here, but uh, I believe that actually did have actual search volumes. Uh, historically, and you could relate that to these relative search volumes. But this issue of presenting what the true search quantities are is, is something that's, um, that does not seem to be something Google's interested in sharing, perhaps for privacy reasons, perhaps for competitive reasons, I'm not sure what. And so at best what we've been able to deal with is relative, is, is having long periods of time at a day-by-day -day resolution with common 
relative variation and not at least we don't have to worry that you know uh, what 100 means in this period is different when 100 means in that period we can we can normalize for all of that yeah and so I think we're doing pretty well now I will share with you and I hope you know Google doesn't send police or something <laughs> yeah I would share with you I think we do have an algorithm to find out what the likely true number is <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to go into it here. You, you, you would all run away. Oh, but but Winchell and I have discussed it, and I actually think I think we can figure out. But it's it's rather involved, and it might violate. I don't. I, I would rather not be kicked off of Google for, for life or something like that because I track their algorithm. But I, I believe I believe that um, that it could be inferred uh, in a rather clever way um, yeah so so a few other points here so we can download these these items we can also compare so if we look at um, you know if we look at vaccination for example um, uh, we might be interested the degree to which vaccination interest is correlated with or covaries with um, with uh, flu flu basin and and what one thing you'll notice is there's this very tantalizing period in the second wave of the flu pandemic 2009-2010 where vaccination seemed to rise very strongly with the amount people were searching with you know for for flu related terms right um, uh, another thing I might look at is um, you know uh, flu symptoms something like that uh, and here you'll find you know, uh, a pattern. This, in this case, it's yellow, um, which which has a high degree of co covariation. I'm going to get rid of just uh, for ease of seeing it. Get rid of this one, and you'll see quite a degree of common covariation here, indicating there's probably a lot of similar interests driving both of these types of searches over time. Okay. Um, so these searches provide their different faces of some underlying phenomena that involves interest, you know, um, health information seeking and so on, that we could explore more completely with a dynamic model to explain these patterns. But they're not, they're not solitudes. They're not independent things. They are a reflection. They're different parts of, of an underlying elephant here. Um, I'd like to show you one or two more features associated with uh, Google uh, flu trends. Um, I will just, just before I do that, I would like to note that whilst I chose influenza, that's not a privileged or unusual example. This is for Lyme disease. Uh, this is in the, um, uh, the Massachusetts in particular. Um, uh, and you'll notice it's strongly seasonal character, right? Once again, you find the biggest number in the graph is always 100. So you have to be uh, uh, aware of that. Um, tick bite and Lyme disease. Um, you'll notice this sort of reflective pattern, right? People who are, Maybe they've gotten bitten by a tick themselves and they're wondering about symptoms or, or worries about Lyme disease. Maybe they know someone who was bitten by a tick. Maybe it was their child and they're wondering about Lyme disease themselves, right? Um, the point is, these once again are, 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 are shared manifestations of some underlying uh, concerns of the sort we, we think about in a dynamic modeling context and system science model. How about Lyme disease and rash? Turns out, uh, for those not familiar with it, Lyme disease has a characteristic bullseye rash that is sometimes presented associated with it. Um, and um, uh, here we could see, you know, a lot of interest in rashes as a symptom of Lyme disease. On, this, on the other hand, you can get spurious correlations, right? Um, here's one with uh, limited direct causal connection, uh, Lyme disease and sunburn. What's the common interest here? Well, people are outside in the summer, right? They're getting exposed, there's various environmental risks. So just because you see correlation does not necessarily imply causation, 
Um, uh, okay, um, this is West Nile virus um, uh, here, and this is in the U.S. Uh, uh, two different, um, two different ones. Okay, this, uh, this is uh, Zika searches. Um, Google provides a way of looking at news mentions. So in the uh, within the interface here. Um, you could look at web searches or you could look for news sources, okay? Uh, this is searching in, in, in news, uh, news articles, for example. Um, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it is worth seeing the degree to which media mentions might be playing, uh, playing a role. Um, uh, and... Uh, less the total counts, is that right? Sorry? That's less the total counts, is that right? So, so, so if you look at just Zika mm -hmm. yep. virus, that includes people's keyword searches plus the news. Uh, uh, no, the, the Zika is, it's only keyword searchers. And, and here uh, news is looking in, uh, in news stories, um, uh, not including any web searchers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, this tool that I wanted to further introduce you to is called uh, Google Correlate. And that, that is a, a nice companion uh, for Google Trends. So if you go to Google Correlate, um, you will see both the strengths and the limits of, of looking at this uh, associationally if you start to explore it seriously. Um, so here we can um, enter data and search for searches, find search terms that correlate with that data, okay? So maybe we have data on number of influenza cases over time within our jurisdiction as reported by health authorities, and uh, we want to find search terms that correlate with that, for example. Um, uh, we can also search, for example, for influenza here and, and uh, find other search terms that correlate very strongly with it. Now, you'll notice here that there's normalized, once again, search activity. And what it's saying is that there's uh, approximately a 95% correlation between people's searches for flu virus and their searches for influenza. Um, or searches for flu and influenza and flu signs um, and flu influenza and flu spread and uh, uh, oseltamivir, which I guess is uh, the Tammy flu um, prophylaxis. Uh, those are somewhere upwards of 90% um, correlation. Um, so here we can get some picture of how things are correlated. This is between influenza on the one hand and, and flu virus on the other. And uh, we, we can look at it over time or indeed as a scatter plot. Okay. Um, so this can give you a sense of related searches for your term. Um, so if we were to look at, for example, um, uh, fentanyl, right? Um, people searching for fentanyl, um, uh, we might also find uh, find them searching for overdose related factors. Now, cricket. <laughs> Sorry? I did an opioid because cricket comes up as well. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, I believe that was on a certain list of drug slang. Um, and, uh, and this is an individual who may be, or the people using this term, um, maybe uh, those familiar with drug slang and using it in a way that um, finds information that otherwise wouldn't be, be easily found online. Um, uh, so here we can often find uh, additional terms. Um, it can also be used to find alternative searches where people are, who might not have full health literacy or or, or have ready access to, to, to important um, guidance can engage in further behavior. Like, let's search for Zika, Z-I-K-A, uh, right? Here we go. 
Oh, okay, no results. Okay, that's interesting. Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, when I've done this uh, previously, uh, I have found difference. Ah, here we go. Zika virus. You'll notice here they're searching for it also as ZYCA um, and uh, ZEEKA. And they're also searching for mosquito related information related to here. So often this will clue you in to, to a, a complex of factors are a complex of other search terms that are highly, highly relevant, right? Um, uh, Z-E-I-K-A, it will clue you into other searches that may be of interest in terms of, um, of this sort of uh, behavior. So uh, Google, Google search, uh, Google Trends is powerfully paired up with uh, Google Correlate to identify alternative um, uh, alternative names for it um, uh, okay so um, uh, here's um, measles uh, different periods um, and you can look at I, I should have shown this earlier um, uh, so here we'll go to uh, we'll go to look at for example pertussis And you'll notice um, uh, here uh, some of the synonyms, which are absolutely key to be thinking about, like whooping cough, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, powerful uh, tools to be used together to recognize alternative search terms. Um, uh, this is uh, from work done by uh, Anahita, where she looked at a variety of search terms for Quebec during the H1N1 uh, outbreak, um, the pandemic, and found quite a distinctive set of patterns uh, accompanied them um, as they all reflected some underlying concerns uh, shared. This is for naloxone, the uh, antagonist for, uh, for opioids. Um, why would we use this data? Well, this sort of data is at a certain level, crude in the sense of its aggregate, it's not nearly as high resolution at an individual level. On the other hand, it um, it it is incredibly voluminous. It, I, I think, I I think it's fair to say that I conduct at least one web search a day, sometimes, you know, ten or more a day. Um, it's not uncommon for people to have dozens a day, and. This can provide a bit of a window into people's interests and and health, particularly health information seeking, um, in in many cases. Um, it's about sixty thousand. Uh, I think it's greater than sixty thousand uh, searches per second that go on worldwide. It's a very large number. It cuts across um, uh, sub subgroups in our society. Um, uh, it's very widespread. Um, use of, of search engines and indeed across languages. It's not universal. China, uh, for example, does not make use of the Google search engine. But within North America, you know, Google search is, is, is overwhelmingly used. Um, uh, it's very high temporal resolution by traditional data standards, although imperfect. I mean, it's, you know, a day, a day resolution going back. And you can find varying geographic uh, resolution. Um, you know, if we were to go look in Canada um, uh, here, uh, so in Canada, we will we'll find its own patterns. Um, and you'll notice that uh, these differ by, by region. Um, if we were to click on Saskatchewan, what we would find is a somewhat noisier picture. Why noisier? Well, in large part, uh, smaller search volumes. Um, uh, there's likely fewer counts that are, that are factoring into this. Um, but it does provide some understanding here. You'll notice that it breaks it down by Saskatoon versus uh, Regina here. Um, and and you know, shows, a, shows a further breakdown. Um, 
In some areas, there's coarser resolution and some uh, finer, but um, uh, it does allow for some geographic specificity. Um, it is broadly used for health information seeking. You can use it to recognize some element of um, uh, message retention. And from a public health perspective, what people are searching for often indicates their understanding of what's important with respect to a health message or, or what's uh, a concern. And being able to look at that from the lens of, of frequent um, search behavior is, is valuable. And you can compare, as we've seen, with other searches. Um, and we've seen uh, Google correlate the capacity to look at news stories, um, timing of product introduction, et cetera. Um, there's some big weaknesses here, though, as well. It's very valuable, but there's some areas where it falls short of what we can achieve with other methods. It's medium to low temporal resolution. I mean, a day is quite good by traditional standards, but low, low level of resolution by smartphone standards. Um, it can be difficult to interpret. Just because someone is searching for someone doesn't necessarily um, give a clear reason why they're searching for it. Um, uh, user subgroups are unclear. We're not able to distinguish who is searching. Um, and there's you know, many unobserved confounders. Amongst other things, if you look over broad periods of time, technology change, et cetera. Often it's coarse geographic resolution. Um, we can't make out neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, and no ability to, to recognize distinct users or progression of users. And of course, it's not a representative sample. That being said, that last one, there's very widespread use of these sort of, uh, of, of search engines. And so it's, it's a broad segment of society that's engaged in searching. It's just regrettable that we can't get a handle on what are some of the concerns more specifically, for example, um, in lower income individuals or, or from the north of our province, et cetera. Okay. Search behavior, powerful and uh, a useful tool for generating reference patterns that can interface with dynamic models. And Anahita will give you a sense of, of how, to, uh, how to undertake it. I will note, and final remark here, that when you specify what you want to show here, you can choose between a particular search term and searches related to a disease or, for example, a film called flu. So if we were to search for disease, for example, I believe it's grouping sets of queries that relate to it. So flu or the flu or influenza or H1N1 would be grouped together. And by, by choosing a topic, this disease, um, rather than a search term, you're often better off by taking advantage of this grouping. You recall um, below we, we saw related, earlier we saw related topics, and this, uh, this has made use of, of, of a topical search to good effect here. So, um, valuable tool and one that gives a lot of uh, dynamic information. Um, uh, information over time with respect to um, uh, to health uh, health information seeking behavior and concerns and interests, and one that will provide a potent vehicle for informing models through the data science lens. Any question about search behavior? Easily downloadable, freely available. It's pretty pretty attractive proposition. Questions? Yeah. be showing another example of it, which has to do with cases of models which um, depict behavior um, that uh, is 
is hard to, to measure directly um, or which is not measured directly. For example, um, anxiety is about flu or fear about, about flu. Or in the case of opioids, um, um, information seeking related to dark web activity. In other words, finding, finding um, uh, uh, routes for opioid acquisition via illegal means or um, opioid treatment um, searches, which m might lead someone to engage in, um, in treatment uh, in facilities where health information is not available. And it turns out that in, in corresponding models for these sort of um, events, we'll often have so dynamic models, systems models, whether they be agent-based or, or a system dynamics aggregate um, depiction and character, we'll often have those parts of the system posited, something's going on in the model about that. Remember, the systems models are depicting the underlying mechanisms posited to be operating the system, and many of them are often latent, meaning we don't have direct information on them. And often that's not a, 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 a you know, a showstopper at all, because we do have information on certain parts, like opioid deaths or you know, um, cases of, of, of opioid treatment, which are publicly captured, or opioid prescriptions written. But there may be broad <coughs> areas of a system, whether it's depicted in an agent-based model or aggregate model, where we don't have good information. And what we can do with this sort of data is at least pin down, at an aggregate level, how much activity there likely is, or how much um, um, how much is likely going on in trends over time in that area because it will pin down an interpretation about what's going on more broadly within the system across not just the areas where we do have detailed measurements but areas where we don't and it will illuminate areas of the system in terms of of ruling out certain hypotheses for what's happening and making more plausible other hypotheses and to do that, we combine it with these data science methods, machine learning methods that we'll be talking about. Things like particle filtering or particle MCMC. And even this aggregated data will often allow us to, to rule out as, um, as non-responsive, as, as, as not consistent with the evidence, certain hypotheses for what's going on. So it might seem like this is, um, it's, it's hopeless to inform um, the, the model with it because the model's an agent-based model. We have all these people doing things, but this is aggregate data. But the model, when we have all these people engaged in behaviors and we total up the numbers um, uh, and, and we posit, okay, people are more likely to search for dark web if they're, if they're in a disordered state with respect to opioids, et cetera, it starts to pin down plausible hypotheses for how much behavior there is in that, uh, in that area of the model and how it's changing over time. And that often can give us that extra bit of, of confidence about a hypothesis for what's going on in the underlying system. I don't know if I'm answering that with clarity, but it turns out even this data, crude though it is, can be helpful. And what Anahita will show in a very powerful result that I think has great significance goes back to a lesson that I first learned in dabbling in bioinformatics in the late 1990s. Um, my, my interest was very much in the health side, uh, but I had some friends who tried to get me involved in the bioinformatics world. And I, I, I did get a little bit involved. And it was interesting because at that time, this is the late 1990s, there was a, a kind of, um, there, there was a culture clash going on between computer scientists and bioinformatics um, who are seeking to draw on as much, many types of data as possible, and then biologists um, who, who often were used to exquisitely controlled, very well calibrated experiments. And the idea of drawing on data that was noisy and even if it was voluminous, it was it, it, you know, it was unseemly in its, in its mix. It had lots of errors and, 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 and possible problems with it. it struck biologists as, as dangerous because it was, you know, um, contaminating 
a very finely, um, uh, finely uh, articulated set of understanding with stuff that was very uh, lower quality. But it turns out that in the end, the, um, the data scientists, the early data scientists and bio bioinformaticians from the computer science side um, won the argument. Because what, what was discovered is that even if you add in a somewhat lower quality data source, you're still getting more information. And as long as you weight it properly and sort of consider it with as to be fits its, its lower pedigree, you can actually do tremendous, get tremendous amounts of extra insight from voluminous but somewhat lower quality data. Now that's, that's them fighting words for, for certain individuals at the time, but it's been borne out. And statistically, we can show it. I mean, if you actually look at the statistical literature, um, you know, it's, it's well known that if you have two distributions, you know, trying to, trying to get in, in uh, excuse me, if you have um, two different samples and one sample is larger measurement error than another one, um, uh, it's, you actually still can, can gain by, by considering the measurements for that, for, from that distribution with larger standard deviation. Um, as long as uh, as long as you weight it properly, weight it more low uh, in a lower way than the other samples, you can get a lot more information from it. And so it is with this sort of data. What Anahita has shown is that if you only consider the finest sources of data of evidence, like clinically confirmed um, H1N1 influenza cases, on the one hand, and and you you inform a model with those using this technique known as particle filter, and I'll be talking about. Uh, versus if you use both types together, this sort um, of, of keyword search volumes and the clinical, you can do so much better with both than you can be with one. And you may say, well, that's weird because this is, this is quite uncontrolled. It's lower quality data. Yeah, it's lower quality data. But it really adds information. There's a lot of information there that can really help inform your understanding of the system. It really, at an operational level, very much improves the quality of the, the model uh, understanding that emerges from it. And this is one of the lessons of this boot camp that I hope you'll take away. It's not that we have to sort through these types of information and only save the very finest stuff. It's we have to be savvy to the fact that evidence comes and different flavors and different levels of pedigree and strength, we have to be savvy to that. But at the same time, we have to recognize that new types of information, even aggregate information and character, can really add richness to the picture that we get out by this triangulation process. Um, and really, so much of the work that I think lies before us in data science and system science is this sort of tomographic reconstruction of what's going on in the underlying processes out there in the world, where we have not just the way tomography works is you have not just one image of what's going on, however good it is. You have multiple images from many angles, each of which is very flawed, but collectively, they, they illuminate with great confidence what's happening in a 3D perspective. And that's what we get out of these system science tools together with dynamic models. We get this kind of um, 3D vision of what's going on in the underlying system that transcends any one data source and, and that complements the limitations of one data source with limitations of the others to give a cohesive picture. Um, and you'll see the various techniques through the week, things like uh, hidden Markov modeling, things like, um, uh, things like particle filtering or particle MCMC uh, can do exactly that. They can help us, they can help us point to the underlying elephant from these, from these data sources which, um, which just relate to some sub-piece of it. And even aggregate data can be, can be tossed in there. Um, it might seem lower quality, but it adds a lot of information when it's about parts of the system that you otherwise don't have information, good information on. So, long answer to a short question, but I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and it's for things to come. Great question. Other questions I can answer. Remember that answering your questions, answer, uh, addressing your needs is my foremost goal. So, 
Is there anything else I can answer about this communicational data or more broadly about what I'm saying? Uh, the silence has it. Okay. Um, okay. So we will continue on to our next topic within this, um, this one of communicational behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk with you about social media. And I want to talk with you about social media, not as some undifferentiated mass, but as, as a set of technologies which differ a great deal in their particulars, but provide a common set of insights um, uh, into people's knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, um, reactions to messaging. Um, and broadly, when it comes to this topic, um, which is a rich topic that you know days could be spent discussing the particulars of this, I wanted I want to delineate two types of social media as very different, and very different in how you have to approach them, very different in the practicalities of running studies with them. And broadly, it's between the ones that are shown in black on this slide and the ones that are shown in green. The ones that are shown in green, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are platforms where information is published to a group. Okay, It's, it's a sort of self-publishing platform. So Twitter, for example, um, I'm putting information out there to individuals who may subscribe to my feed, right? Um, uh, as in YouTube, you might not think of it as a social media site. Boy, is it a social media site. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I mean, what, you know, two to 3,000 videos up there and getting comments on them and, and shares and all sorts of stuff. That's a, that is one heck of a social media uh, platform. Um, uh, you think about LinkedIn, you think about, uh, you think about Tumblr or Reddit. These are platforms, ladies and gentlemen, where people share their thoughts, feelings, uh, concerns, uh, opinions um, with a broad set of, of individuals. By contrast, these other platforms, um, WhatsApp, Facebook, Viber, QQ Chat, etc., these are, are, are closer to private um, uh, pri uh, private spaces often. Now Facebook, yes, I'm well aware there are public Facebook sites and, and people have um, sometimes choose to elect to, um, to embrace a broader set of people um, uh, in, coming to their Facebook page. But the fundamental expectations of privacy are very different for the platforms uh, in green than the platforms in black. And this makes all the world of difference when it comes to ethics boards. Because with ethics boards, harvesting Twitter, it's like finding, it's, it's, it's like gathering information that's placed out there in the public domain. The ethical concerns are minimal with it. Um, people are broadcasting their opinions. People can subscribe to it um, w without particular interaction with the, uh, with the individual tweeting. Um, and we can pursue research in those areas uh, very readily. We can uh, subscribe to someone's uh, LinkedIn channel or, or YouTube postings in a very ready way. Whereas if we try to get involved in monitoring Facebook activity or WhatsApp activity, it's an entirely different world. And what I'm talking about here um, in this lecture is more about the green ones. It's about self-publishing platforms and monitoring self-publishing platforms. It's not to say that you can't do amazing work on Facebook, you can, but the ethics of pursuing that, um, that work uh, is delicate and um, textured and requires uh, a lot more considerations than I have time to talk about here. Okay, um, so what are, what's the use of these self-publishing platforms? Well, they provide a glimpse of diversity and express attitudes, beliefs, opinions, feelings across large swaths of the population. Um, they're an amazing window into how people react to messages, what the sort of dominant discourse is on particular topics. You can capture changing um, attitudes over time. Um, 
Uh, and uh, there is um, changing attitudes um, uh, towards the privacy of these matters and platform developers and regulators and social media more generally, but self-publishing platforms are pretty, are, are pretty well stable in terms of allowing people to, to, to gather insight from them. There's real diversity among platforms, and um, I would note that it's an important, it's not merely a mirror of opinion, it shapes opinions in big ways. What's on social media doesn't just mirror our knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, it shapes them in some profound ways. Okay? Um, now, my discussion here stands in contraposition to the discussion in the area of um, Google searches. Social media, um, uh, in contrast to Google searches, are much more fragmented. Um, there's real variation worldwide in platform use. Um, so uh, a very large set of population worldwide is on WeChat, for example, in, in Chinese-related and Southeast Asian-related spheres, sort of uh, Asian markets. Um, uh, Viber is quite big in the South Asian community, as I understand. Um, uh, QQ chat also um, quite large in, in Asia. Um, uh, and there's pronounced differences between the, the platforms in terms of socioeconomic groups, privacy, types of contents, etc. But self-publishing platforms are again public fora uh, for, for, um, for expression and, and I'm focusing on those here. And I'd like to focus for this discussion on Twitter in particular, which we have large databases for, um, uh, for uh, in the area of Western Canada. Um, going back now about two years. Um, participation in this platform is extremely high. Worldwide, it's about 325 million users, about uh, 100 million active users, and about in the US, it's somewhere upwards of 65 million um, active users. Very high volume. Um, uh, it can be uh, approaching 10,000 tweets a second um, in busy periods. I believe it actually may now regularly exceed that. Um, I know in the last presidential election in the U.S. it got upwards of, of 10K, and I believe it's upwards of that now. Um, now, from our own experience, about 3% of tweets are health-related. And you may say, well, that's, that's a very small number. And I agree, it's not a large, uh, a large fraction, but it's a very large number of tweets. It's a very large volume of tweets. Um, so, you know, 3%, uh, for example, of of, of 10 K, uh, you know, tweets per second is, is still, you know, 300, 300 uh, health related tweets per second, which is quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, uh, what's particularly notable is geotagging and geoinferencing is possible on many tweets, not all, so you can pin down where it's coming from. And you can filter by content, by geography and time, and by, crudely, by sentiment. Um, uh, and um, very importantly, not only the tweet topic is of interest, but the tweet sender, which is, is indicated, and the fact that a tweet is retweeted tells you a lot about often people's attitudes towards it. Not always, there can be negative retweets where someone passes on a tweet, they, they, pass, they retweet because they think it's outrageous, but by and large, it provides some, uh, some indication of support or agreement or interest, certainly interest in this. Um, and liking of tweets is also a formidable source of, of information. One thing that's notable about tweeting is you can engage in what's called streaming analysis, which I may have a separate lecture on, but basically it gives you tweets over time. And I want to I highlight some tweets. I, I, we have a massive set of tweets that we have compiled. Um, it runs into tens of millions. Um, and um, this is an example of, of suicide-related discussion over time. Um, uh, you'll notice the very episodic nature of this discussion. I'm, again, looking at this through a dynamic lens. Look at the pulse of things. So, you know, there's, there's sudden discussion um, that goes up by orders of magnitude. And then within a few days, each, each little bar is, is a day here. It comes down. This is Alberta. It comes down, comes down, comes down. Um, it's a very bursty 
um, sort of large amount of discussion and then uh, drop off. I believe this was uh, Anthony Bourdain's uh, tragic uh, death there. Um, and uh, the types of information that merely mention the term suicide are, are, uh, are, are very varied. It's not necessarily an indication of concern about serious suicide. And, and one of the challenges here is, um, is sorting through this, this thing, which includes you know, things that are obvious jokes, they include things that are probably jokes. Um, uh, there are things here that are are distressing, um, uh, and you know there are there are things which are clearly cries for help. Um, and uh, when you're looking at tweets, one has to go beyond simple counts of. Of, of, of particular mentions of a word um, to include um, a, a broader set of, of terms. It's not merely like looking at one search query. You often want to be able to search for other things that connote the same thing, you know, like shoot myself um, as a as a indication of suicidal ideation beyond the word suicide or kill myself. These are these are things that are indicative of an ideation that go beyond simple matching of keywords. And at the same time, the variations in how these terms are used cause, calls for a certain caution. And we've done quite a bit of work. My student Yuan, my student uh, uh, Xiao Yan, um, have done quite a bit of work in trying to have machine learning classifiers that actually take a tweet and say, look, is this, is this a serious reference to a suicidal ideation, or is this uh, a serious uh, mention to a case of influenza, for example. Um, uh, here's some opioid-related tweets. Um, some are very meaningful, um, certainly. Um, some are very ambiguous, um, uh, and uh, you know, some suggest uh, uh, a certain desperation. Um, uh, the, the content of these tweets are very meaningful in a way that a search, looking at a search term, would not be. You know, a search term gives some indication of interest. What you see here is a much more textured <laughs> set of, 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 of concerns or much more textured set of, of messages um, that have to be considered from the perspective of uh, of, of understanding the underlying, um, the underlying concerns, but very, very helpful. Um, I would highlight that that responses of tweets. Oh yeah, I have a question. yeah. Um, so it was in your previous slide you had question marks, right? Yeah. And those are indicative of emoticons. Yeah. Do that's you right. use like emoticons also as information? That's very, very interesting question. The answer is. We are seeking to do that going forward. There's actually a bunch of information beyond emoticons too, like keyword references that can be disambiguating. Um, and uh, and uh, also references to external resources like links that may provide disambiguation. Uh, going forward, we would like to use that, um, but we haven't made, I would say, proper use of it yet. There are, there are some uh, parties that have done further work in this regard, and um, that uh, I think we have to learn from some of their best practices when it comes to parsing these tweets in a way that would then allow for informing models with them. But you're absolutely right, that's a rich source of information, and there's several other types of information that are, um, uh, that are obvious uh, for the, the picking, and that really need to be considered to make full use of this. So thank you for the, the question there. Does that address yeah. your question? Yeah. Other questions about this? So I want to note that tweets provide an intriguing window in terms of the dynamics of response to messages. It's not that tweets just pop up in isolation according to some disconnected, you know, independent um, and identically distributed um, mentions. They occur in response to events in the world. Um, those suicide-related tweets um, 
that we saw with the big spikes were typically instigated by celebrity suicides or attempts at suicide or tragic stories about suicides that appear in media, for example. Here we see air quality advisories being issued and a corresponding tweet volume that, that leaps up there uh, regarding some of the concerns and then where the mentions related to the advisories drop off. Tweets provide this window into how people respond to messages that can be very important for helping to refine those messages, for helping to say how can we strengthen our message, which messages are sticking, which messages lead to ongoing discussion in tweets in which fall flat. The dynamics of the underlying situation in response to these messages often provides a cue. Um, this was um, uh, a news event here. Um, I believe tragically, if I'm not mistaken, this was for those for whom um, are familiar with the topic, this is the Colton Bushy um, related um, thing, and this was the Colton Bushy trial. And what you can see here is once again, this characteristic pattern. It's a pattern many of us who work in dynamic modeling know almost in our bones uh, of a first order decay in, in the sort of stock of interest. Um, uh, in this. So you see a large initial mention, then each successive day you're bringing down the amount of interest until it, it goes down, and then it, it spikes up again. Um, very characteristic of how we model um, um, interest levels in response to, a, uh, to an event. They're sort of posited to be some awareness which decays over time as it competes with other priorities. And tragically, the Colton Bushy shooting shares with other tragedies that have occurred during our time, such as the Humboldt Broncos crash, in terms of having these large spikes of awareness and then a decay over time and then spikes again as it's brought up in a decay over time. Um, okay, um, time is, is short here. I uh, did want to note um, the rich interfaces available on Twitter. Twitter has evolved a lot as a platform as we've been following it, as we've been harvesting these tweets, which has broadly occurred since it goes back to 2016, late 2016, um, for our province. Uh, and then um, a little bit later since then. Um, the Twitter interface has actually provided additional richness during that time. This is a somewhat older version whereby you can um, uh, perform advanced searches and find searches, for example, within a certain area and try to request sentiments. Is there a sentiment? So, for example, things that mention vaccination in a negative fashion. Now, I, I will tell you that my own observation is that, and this incidentally is a way that emoticons are considered, you'll notice they try to parse emoticons within the, um, within the message as a way of inferring sentiment, as, a, as one way of inferring sentiment. Um, but from my experience with Twitter's classification scheme, which you can use in harvesting mechanisms, such as we perform, it's quite crude. In other words, if you look at negative tweets about vaccination, you will find negative tweets about people criticizing vaccination, for example. Um, and, and it's not very good at, at distinguishing, you know, um, people are pro-vaccination and anti. You can't just plug it in and expect that, okay, I'm gonna get my anti-vaxxers and my pro-vaxxers here. It's not that simple at all. But it does allow for some gathering of information about you know, um, sentiments within, within tweets themselves. I would recommend TweetDeck as a powerful interface as well in this area. TweetDeck uh, is an interface that allows for monitoring over time um, queries and issuing queries uh, that are geographic specific. So here, for example, I'm looking for um, a mentioning vaccine within 50 miles of Boston um, and um, searching, searching for, um, uh, for ones that are negative uh, as well. And I can see the results. Um, this is useful for kind of uh, ad hoc um, queries out there. Um, 
Uh, and you can get in place this kind of persistent monitoring that you can come back to to monitor what's the pulse of discussion here. Um, our own system is quite a bit more sophisticated with that. And before you leave, I will be providing you with the code. If you want to harvest tweets, well, tell you how we harvest tweets. Um, it's a good harvest. Um, yeah. One of Saskatchewan's finest. <laughs> uh, we actually harvest tweets in uh, in two different ways. Um, one that's um, uh, that gathers a much larger set, but including some from other neighboring jurisdictions, and then a more strict set. And and between the two, you have um, uh, you can kind of uh, have have. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a larger but less certain set or smaller uh, ones, you're more certain for our, for our province. The same could be applied to other provinces, although I, I will tell you, drawing on the comments of our um, premier two, two times ago, um, we do benefit from the fact that Saskatchewan is the hardest province to spell but the easiest to draw. Um, <laughs> and so we can delineate the geographic boundaries with, uh, with uh, latitude, longitude in a very nice way. Alberta, um, Manitoba, and others will have a harder time um, delineating it, but it's readily possible. It just takes you know, a day of work or something. Um, so what are, some, what are some benefits and shortcomings of Twitter? We do a heck of a lot of work these days with Twitter. It's one of the platforms I'm most excited to be working with. Well. Um, Okay, one shortcoming is it does disproportionately focus on a vocal population segment. This is not indicative, broadly indicative of a representative sample of opinions in the population. And I would say it falls well short of Google searches, for example, in coming from the rank and file of people. You get a lot of people on Twitter who are thought opinion leaders or institutions or um, individuals with, um, with very defined opinions on things. Uh, and they tend to be a, a, a notable group on Twitter. There's also lots of people tweeting who are, who are not particularly you know, uh, elites in society or, or, or really um, privileged. But, but the fact is, it's a skewed platform towards higher income individuals, um, by and large. Um, doing good geographical filtering is not trivial. Um, so last, last estimate I heard, I believe it's come up perhaps significantly from them, about 3% of tweets, so I know I said 3% of tweets are health related and I stand by that. This is a different statistic that happens to have the same rough proportion. I think it's somewhere between 3 and 5% of tweets that are geotagged. When I say geotagged, I mean they're tagged with latitude and longitude. There's a much larger set that are associated with a place. So the tweet is sent from a place, so we'll say tweet sent from Saskatoon. There's quite a large set where the person sending it says they are in Saskatoon. And collectively, what that means is if you piece all those together, um, you can get a pretty likely reading on where a lot of tweets are from. There's some wonderful work by Mark Dredsky and others that have explored inferencing. So maybe we can't figure out where this tweet is from, but we know the people who, who are related to the person who sent this tweet who subscribe to them or what have you, and we know where they're located. So probably this tweet, if 90% of their people subscribing to them are in Saskatoon, there's a pretty good chance this is from Saskatoon. Um, so there's some inferencing. But the point is, we can't take most tweets and say, ah, it's from exactly here. We're not at that point yet. But we can take a lot of tweets and know where they're from. So, so that's, that's a consideration. Um, the brevity of tweets can raise interpretation challenges. They did relax that, um, but it can still be a little bit inscrutable. Is this a joke or not? Um, what does this really mean? Um, it's good to have some young people around who can sometimes sense that. We, we actually had a um, process for tweet classification where 
um, we asked people in the lab to help classify the tweets. And, and my sense is that it, that it can be very helpful to have people who are younger interpreting whether a tweet is a joke, for example, et, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, maybe who know that sick means it's good. And <laughs> boy, am I feeling sick today, you know. Um, uh, they know, oh, okay, that, that means he's feeling really great. Um, okay, um, uh, so uh, another thing, um, again, I'm offering our tweet harvesting interfaces as part of this event. You should be aware that it took us a while to refine these. Um, in our first in our first cut, we naively subscribed to a streaming um, interface for Twitter, and it turns out that only gives you about 1% of tweets, okay? Uh, it's, it, you get a 1% fire hose pipeline, so you get tweets streamed to you, but it's only 1% sample. And you can do it vastly better than that with some, um, some appropriate designs and, and using more recent features of the so-called API. Um, uh, so I recommend uh, uh, considering uh, platforms uh, for great flexibility. Uh, if you need really interactive tools, there's some good ones out there, um, but they're predominantly paid um, or, or custom program. There's a social feed manager, which is open source. I was gonna feature it in this event, but um, some of my students helped me realize there's some security issues with it. <laughs> And so we want to be careful about recommending it, but I, I think its functionality is great. It allows you to declaratively say, I want to subscribe to this in this area, and, and it's pretty good. But the problem is the way it's set up raises security concerns. You can speak with uh, Lucia outside, who's, who's, a, who's very knowledgeable about this. Um, and um, another challenge here is social media changes over time. Um, you know, I'm told that Facebook is being abandoned by younger people. Um, it's no longer the place to be, and even Instagram is changing. And basically, you, it's hard to work in this area without having to, rec without, without grappling with the fact you have to change every few years to accommodate new platforms, et cetera. Um, so what does this give you? Well, it gives you level of reaction, uh, retweets and likes, can give you a lot of insight. Um, they can give you um, insights into how people react to messages, for example, advisories, the diversity of reaction, what are counter messages. So when the Prevention Institute or the Lung Association puts out a, a cautionary tweet about using Juul or using e-cigarettes, how do people react to it? What are they saying in response? What are they what are they saying that's skeptical about it? Or when you put out a, uh, a vaccine uh, advisory, how do people react in terms of spreading skepticism? It's very useful for that. Um, and to what degree are their reactions to those come from messages that push back against them? It can really give this understanding of attitudes, narratives, and beliefs for, for these different groups. Um, and. Um, you know, can allow you to adapt messaging if you're trying to shape things effectively uh, as an intervention. Um, there's been some fascinating work done by some of my colleagues in the States on community healing and getting a picture of that through tweets. This is something that um, they've taken up to understand how do communities react to disasters. So a disaster like a tornado in Alabama, um, or or a um, uh, you know a, a, scoop, a shooting, a school shooting, um, how does the community react? To what degree is there a healing that is manifested online? Um, um, what are what are some of the major elements of that? Um, they've done some amazing work with that, and some of our look at the Humboldt Broncos uh, tragedy. Um, also suggests you know uh, opportunities for similar insights um, here. Um, so I mentioned earlier um, the greatest value, in our opinion, comes from standardized, validated data sources. But we have found that larger volumes of lower quality data are still very useful. Um, they provide an opportunity to triangulate. Um, and having additional high volume but lower quality data sets can sometimes make a real difference 
and the um, uh, and the insights uh, that that you can you can get from it. Um, okay, uh, I could show that, but I think I'll stop there. So that was some comments on communicational behavior. Um, any questions that I can answer more broadly on that, or on the topic of some of these big data data sources? Yeah. So sometimes on Twitter there are bots. Okay. Yes. So yeah. how, how do you handle yeah. bots? Um, it's a good question. There's an active, there's a set of active lines of research in this area. Um, I think there's two, two related sets of research that I'd like to talk to you about related uh, that are specific to this. One is is bot detection, and um, I could give you some papers which have done a quite good job at spotting bots based on tweeting patterns. Okay. Um, that I think uh, are are not perfect, but they can weed out a lot of shaft from the from the wheat um, with respect to this. So they can they can really um, uh, serve to to, uh, to filter out distraction uh, distracting noise. Um, but there's another related line of research which has to do with institutional tweets versus individual tweets. Okay, because there's a fair number of tweets that are organizational in nature, or institutional in nature, and they're less representative of opinions in society. They're, they may be associated with messaging campaigns, they may be associated with, um, uh, with, uh, with deliberate um, you know, uh, attempts to, to shape opinion. And, and there's also some good work uh, that's done on recognizing those institutional actors. My own observation is that when you, when you look, if you're looking in a specific geographic region, often you can very quickly recognize major institutional actors uh, directly because uh, they're shown by their names, et cetera. But there are sometimes others that are, are more subtle. And some of this machine learning research focuses also not only identifying bots, but separately identifying institutional actors. My impression is that both of these really have done a very good job in, um, in, in being able to recognize them, okay? And um, there is a question, though, here of ground truthing that. So, you know, how do you, how do you know that this is a bot, you know, that's, that's, um, uh, that's uh, sending these things when you train your classifier with respect to it? And um, uh, I think there's going to be continued lines of research, but what they've already done is addresses most of the big needs right now. The disconcerting, the disconcerting sense that I have though is that this is an arms race and bots are becoming more and more sophisticated in terms of, um, of obfuscating the fact that they are a bot <laughs> and um, uh, you know, becoming more and more able to mimic actual individuals. We saw this in the U.S. Um, uh, 2016 election. My understanding is it took place in the 2018 election, and um, it will almost certainly take place with respect to the 2020 election. Um, and um, that's very disconcerting. I suspect you'll find this a very large area of continued work, but I'm impressed by what's already been done. I could give you some paper references. Yeah. Um, there, this is an area of, of sort of making sense of tweets and recognizing um, recognizing their uh, sources and their geographic location where there's just some, some very good parties uh, playing the role. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Terry. Yeah, it's more of a general question around uh, data and data science. And good. The, um, and there's likely references on this, and so we probably just really into it. But as we traditionally, we would have dealt with smaller samples, and so as you get into these large, uh, large data sets, the amount of time that you could spend cleaning that data would be endless, and so there's uh, diminishing returns. But so uh, I'm wondering around standardized procedures for when you have legitimate big data, how much time and energy is spent, or what are the kind of Standards to clean that, to check, you know, to go through and make sure that it's valid, and, and I'm sure it varies maybe by type, obviously the way that you clean 
case would be different than right. you know certain buildings that it's yeah like this that's uh, generated. I mean, if you know the underlying algorithms, you may have level of confidence in that because there's maybe less of these feet and less worry about errors and that. But yeah, I guess if that's a, as yeah. you get into bigger and bigger data, data then as a data scientist, we're kind of yeah. cleaning procedures and that data validation procedures and things. Yeah. No, so so thank you. When I had talked about data science consisting of you know, and mechanisms and, and, and uh, uh, I said tools, one of the, there were several several items, but one of them was processes. And, and some processes are things like uh, cross validation, where we take part of the data, set it aside, you know, train our models in one set, and then compare them against that other set. But another process is the data cleaning, the data preparation, data scrubbing, and and uh, and elements of data transformation. Um, this is a point of uh, where there's a lot that could be said. I mean, um, it's it's one of the reasons why I think it, it is important to have um, uh, have in place. <coughs> Some sort of repositories that are are curated and, and, and recognized and documented and where metadata is stored uh, for them, etc. So that's that's one piece of it. Um, it's also it's also a an area which where standards are fast evolving for reasons that I, I we just talked about that you know that. The shifting use of Twitter, but also the the growing preponderance of bots and of um, uh, and of uh, yes, institutional actors, etc. Um, we uh, we the, the the concerns now are different than what they were five years ago with respect to cleaning, and all of this puts a premium on good metadata and provenance. And what, when I say provenance, what I'm talking about is keeping track of um, the, the origin of data we're working with, um, what sort of version of the data cleaning algorithm, from which version of the data cleaning algorithm did it emerge. Um, and uh, I don't know if my students have ever noticed, uh, they may have not paid attention to this, um, uh, but I'm actually very careful when I modify my uh, harvesting algorithm um, to to associate that with a new version of, of the data so that so that in any one analysis I'm very clear about what's the, the pipeline that led to this data being incorporated because the, the inferences I make with it might be different if I used an earlier version of the algorithm and what this means is it's not only, data science is not only about keeping track of, 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 of data, you know, storing data. It's about storing metadata that describes that data and relates it to, to, um, uh, to you know, the processing that, that made, you know, contributed to it and, and cleaned it, et cetera. So, so that's, that's also a part of, of this puzzle, sort of keeping good metadata records. Um, and often that's tied with things like good repository management for for storing successive versions of your 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 um, uh, code for for uh, harvesting the data or what have you. Um, th these are good practices which are creeping outside of computer science to uh, data scientists more broadly from statistical background or what other back whatever other background. Um, beyond that, though, I think. I think you know we we need to also recognize that that the impact of data quality is more than a story about the data cleaning processes that go into it because indeed the data cleaning for one analysis may be different than the data cleaning for another and as you say at some point there's diminishing returns um, data you know the, the impact of adverse data quality um, needs to be considered in the broader sphere of, of what's the goal of a project and what's the, um, what's the sensitivity of the model 
to a degree of, of misestimation. I mean, the fact is we have limited resources often for pursuing projects. And there's often a real opportunity cost. When we put effort into one thing, we don't have the time to put it into something else. Uh, and, and there are certain types of algorithms, and certain types of approaches that work with our, with our dynamic models. Amongst those that I'm going to be presenting tomorrow and the next day, um, which make them much more robust to, to um, uh, challenges in terms of this. Um, an example is, is what we saw earlier with um, search data. Um, with search data, you know, you have this relative, um, you know, level of, of measurement. And at a certain level, you might say that's a data cleaning issue. That's an issue we have to eliminate with data cleaning. You know, we have to go put into place a, a mechanism to correct for this distortion. But for certain types of needs with models, actually, it doesn't matter. It's perfectly fine to use relative data. It offers no more benefit than the than the um, than the data that is delineated at a at a, you know a more precise absolute um, level. And um, and so what I'm trying to say here is I think a lot of the way that we deal with this operationally is choosing approaches that, that handle that data once it gets to the modeling side, which are far more robust um, with respect to, to handling uh, data quality issues. And, um, and you know, it's a, it's a pragmatic approach whose efficacy we can assess by is the model that's the end result of this meeting its goals in terms of, um, uh, of, of face validity and in terms of matching up with the empirical data from other quarters that's, uh, that's available. Because any, and this is, this is one of the things that comes from a system science perspective, a limitation in the quality of data on one measurement, on one particular variable, you might think is going to doom your ability to accurately estimate that measurement. But when we're dealing with coupled nonlinear systems, um, what I'm, what I'm um, trying to communicate is that um, uh, that it's it's a coupled enough system that a, a limitation in any one area. Um, is is going can be complemented by additional data sets that address other other areas of the system. Um, the the variables in it are coupled. They're they're coupled in a way that um, that means that uh, you know a um, an investment uh, in higher quality data in one area can benefit understanding in a different area of the system where the data is actually lower quality in the first place, but could still get better pictures because of the collective triangulation, as it were, that occurs from both, from both sources. And what this means is that um, data quality um, is, is, is a concern. It's, it's something you want to you wanna do a good job on. But often you will find with dynamic models that they're much less sensitive to misestimation of certain parameters than other. And l let's put it this way. This is a, there, there's rigorous mathematics behind this in nonlinear systems that a model can be, you can have, you know, uh, the, same rel the same coefficient of variation um, associated with two different sets of data. The model is going to be vastly less sensitive to it in one, in one place than in another. In other words, a degree of uncertainty at one place is going to make very little difference in model output where uncertainty in another will make a big difference. And so you can use the dynamic model to prioritize which, which of those sources of data it's, it's most vulnerable to quality issues and put the effort into those rather than just saying we, we must have only the highest, you know, only the highest quality data will make it into the repository. And then you end up not having data at all and you end up, you know, end up and, um, with, uh, with a failure to, to be able to capitalize on basic information um, that is available. I, I think it's much more effective to use the model 
and indeed the modeling process of what people are looking for from the model to guide which data items we have to put the most effort into. And that goes into finding new data that's not present now to inform the model about X, or it goes into saying which data source are we really sensitive to quality issues in and we should put more effort into it. Models are very have very different levels of sensitivity to different data. And by exploiting that fact, if we have a model where we're seeking to make decisions based on it or, or use projection estimates based on it, we can use that model to guide us as, okay, which things are really sensitive, which things, it really doesn't pay off. And that is a pragmatic reality that, you know, when we have limited time, we have to prioritize. And this gives us one effective metric to prioritize. I hope that's all. Other questions? Let's run a model. How's that? Let's, let's go out with a bang. What do you think? What do you think? Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to get a bit of, of energy um, into the room here. Okay. So um, I know of no better way to do that than to run a model. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go and we are going to open up a model shared with us by none other than Wade McDonald. Okay, where is Wade? There he is. Okay, great. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to save.